Hey, hello, this is Peter LaRue, I'm a neurosurgeon in Philadelphia in the United States. I'm going to talk about using head CT scan to guide the management of traumatic brain injury. There are no conflicts in this talk. So in traumatic brain injury, there are a lot of strategies of care that have been used, and the three that are most economically attractive include threshold-guided CT scanning, adherence to uh, clinical guidelines, and care of patients in specialized settings. There's several emerging concepts in traumatic brain injury management. When it comes to imaging, perhaps the most important, as you can see here highlighted in red, is disease phenotyping. So neuroimaging gives us great opportunities to improve disease characterization. There are many subtypes of traumatic brain injury, concussion, blast injury, diffuse axonal injury, and then the various hemorrhages that can be seen. CT allows us to phenotype the patient. Here is a subdural hematoma, intraventricular hemorrhage, press skull fracture, multiple contusions, an epidural, cerebral swelling, and a subdural. There are differences in phenotypes between children and adults. Here we're going to concentrate on adults. So CT and traumatic brain injury has significant value, not only in diagnosis and phenotyping, but therapeutic decision-making, whether it be medical or surgical management, guiding the value of multimodality monitoring, helping with prognostication, and importantly, also clearing the cervical spine, which always needs to be considered when there's head injury, vascular imaging, and also for research purposes. Who should get a CT scan with traumatic brain injury? Well, the Canadian CT head rule defines those who are at risk for the likelihood of neurosurgical intervention. In the absence of these features as illustrated here, you don't necessarily need to do a head CT scan. These, obviously, these rules apply to adults. This is the PCAN rule that applies to children as well. In the critical care unit, the CT scan can be used to monitor intracranial beds, either with non-contrast or contrast scanning. CT angiography can look at the vasculature and CT diffusion at flow. It's important to recognize that these are point-in-time measurements, and they give us really anatomic structure, particularly with CT, rather than physiologic data. Most studies, are acquired in axial images, and you get bone and soft tissue windows, and then they can be reconstructed in coronal or sagittal planes. Really, the only contraindication to a head CT scan is an inability of the patient to lie flat. Pregnancy and pediatrics are relative contraindications because of the risk of radiation. Scans can be obtained in a very short period of time. There are some limitations. The major limitation, perhaps, is the remote location, taking the patient away from the ICU. And it's well documented that transport can create risk. Perhaps the significant clinical limitation to CT and traumatic brain injury care is it doesn't always identify other underlying injuries, such as diffuse axonal injury or earlier ischemia. Those limitations notwithstanding, we can use it for CT. The non-contrast CT shows us the anatomic pathology, hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, contusions, and so forth. A contrast CT, which is not frequently needed, allows us to look at other problems we might be able to see vascular anomalies, blood-brain barrier disruption, infection, or the chronic effects of hemorrhage. Perhaps its most important rule is, is diagnosing acute hemorrhage. Because when we're caring for patients with head injury, the initial fork in the road is deciding, do they need surgical intervention or not? The surgical intervention is required when there's a mass lesion. And CT is really all you need to be able to assess, is there an acute hemorrhage after traumatic brain injury? The sensitivity is excellent. In essence, acute hemorrhage is hyperdense. It looks white compared to the brain, which is more gray on imaging. One must recognize that in some instances that acute blood might be isodense, and perhaps can be missed even or because of its appearance. This can occur in anemic patients, those who have coagulopathy, or in the hyperacute stage because the blood has not yet clotted. We can predict intracranial hypertension in those with more severe injury, low Glasgow coma scale, loss of consciousness in a skull fracture, persistent drowsiness in children with refractory vomiting, and high intracranial pressure. Here are the different hemorrhages in trauma, epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, intracerebral hemorrhage, and contusion. They have distinct features. The epidural hematoma won't cross suture lines. The subdural hematoma will. And here you can see an example of an epidural hematoma. The underlying brain is usually not affected and this differentiates it from a subdural hematoma, which is more likely to be venous rather than arterial in origin. The mass effect occurs not only because of the size of the hemorrhage, but the underlying damage and swelling to the brain. Mortality is much higher in a subdural hematoma. 
The most frequent hemorrhage, however, is traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which might be a tiny little dot of blood high up on the convexity. This can be differentiated from aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which tends to be found in the basal systems and more frequently has associated hydrocephalus, which is not as frequently seen in head injury. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage can sometimes be used to identify those patients with diffuse axonal injury. Here you can see a small confusion in the deep white matter, and those microhemorrhages are more frequent when there's axonal injury. But axonal injury usually is better diagnosed with MRI imaging. However, I very rarely obtain an MRI in the acute phase. This is something in a more delayed phase as a patient's not waking up and used for prognostication rather than making therapeutic decisions. The CT can be used to classify head injury. This is useful in research purposes. The most frequently used one is the Rotterdam CT classification. CT can be used to guide surgery. In general, an extra axial mass lesion greater than a centimeter thick, more than five millimeters of midline shift, a hemorrhage greater than three centimeters in diameter that's intracerebral, although this is location dependent, penetrating injury, compound depressed skull fracture are general indications for surgical intervention. Here you can see a patient on the right, or, or on the left, excuse me, when I'm looking at the screen, this very large subdural hematoma with significant mass effect. You can see how the ventricles are shifted from left to right. This would be a patient who would be a candidate for a craniotomy. On the other hand, on this picture, you can see the salt and pepper effect of bifrontal contusions. This might be a patient who would go on a decompressor craniectomy. We can also use CT to decide if patients should be treated. In other words, is there futility in the management? This patient has diffuse swelling. You can see these multiple contusions, including deep white matter, is likely to have a very poor outcome. And depending on other factors, care may not be necessarily rendered. Similarly, in large mass lesions when there's herniation, in this coronal view, you can see the subdural, the massive shift, the asymmetry of the ventricles, on the axial view, a hemorrhage in the brainstem or a Duray's hemorrhage, and evidence also for infarction because of the posterior several artery being involved. In herniation, there's probably little role for surgical intervention given that outcome is inevitably poor. One could predict outcome in gunshot wounds. You may not see that frequently in Europe, but here in the United States, sadly, it is a common problem. A transventricular wound Again, care would not be rendered because these patients ubiquitously have a poor outcome. There are scoring systems that exist that allow us to predict who will do well or not. Intracranial pressure often drives how we manage patients. CT can be used to help define that. Midline shift, particularly more than five millimeters, asymmetry of the lateral ventricle or a trapped lateral ventricle, obliteration of the perimesencephalic cisterns, an optic nerve sheath diameter, among other findings, will suggest raised intracranial pressure. Here are obliterated perimesencephalic systems. In normal ICP, the perimesencephalic systems at the top of the membrane are open, but with increased intracranial pressure, you no longer can see them. Optic nerve sheath diameter is a useful non-invasive parameter, either CT and in some circumstances ultrasound. There are some difficulties using this, but in general, when greater than six millimeters in diameter, it is usually associated with high intracranial pressure. Fractures are something that need to be differentiated from normal structures, such as vessels or sutures. I will not go into the details of how that is done, but it's important to be able to see the normal from the abnormal. There are many different types of skull fractures that you can see from this slide, and each have a different implication to management and care. Perhaps most importantly, or the depressed skull fractures, because these are the ones that require operative intervention. Linear skull fractures generally are predictive of intracranial pathology, and hence the care is directed more to that. The depressed skull fracture in general, when the bone is depressed greater than the, di the, the thickness of the skull, is something that requires surgical intervention because they may well be a dural laceration and hence a CSF leak. And here you can see such a fracture this is a penetrating injury. There's bone fragments in the skull. The, con the, the perhaps relative contraindication to that is if that crosses a major venous sinus, because that could lead to significant bleeding and blood loss. Is there a role for follow-up CT? For the most part, there is, particularly in those patients with severe traumatic brain injury, i.e. Glasgow Cone scale less than eight, patients that we're not able to examine because of sedation or other reasons, 
those who are anticoagulation or have a coagulopathy, any neurologic deterioration. But for the vast majority of patients who have mild traumatic brain injury, and remember that's about 80% of traumatic brain injury, you don't necessarily need to do a repeat CT scan if the patient's clinical exam is unchanged or they're neurologically improving. This is extremely rare that any additional pathology is found. Here's an example, however, of evolution of the pathology. This is a patient with multiple contusions on day one, and on day two, you can see the significant increase in the number of contusions. This may lead to management change. For example, this could be a patient eligible for a bifrontal decompressive craniectomy. It is important not to forget chronic pathology. This is an individual with a bullet in the middle of his head that led to obstructive hydrocephalus and presented several years after his trauma. He has a patient with bilateral chronic subdural hematomas, which has failed to thrive and rehab and develop gait difficulty and required burrow drainage. We use CT to help surgical planning. A patient with a complex compound depressed skull fracture, 3D CT allows, as you can see on this uh, picture on the right, reconstruction of a preformed cranioplasty to reconstruct the skull. The CT is also useful in patients with monitors. This is a probe within the white matter looking at brain oxygen, but the position of that probe is important in determining how management is directed or what the impact of the physiologic values are in outcome because it is dependent on its relationship to other pathology. CT angiography can look at the vessel, CT perfusion can look at the flow, and important in select patients because they are patients who might develop an infarct following trauma. And this can occur for various reasons, most importantly, vessel dissection. Perhaps more important than simply looking at CTA is also looking at perfusion to identify the ischemic penumbra because this can help determine if order regulation is intact and how best to manage those patients. Aneurysms might be seen on CTA. These can be seen anything larger than three millimeters in size. It's important to look for these when there's penetrating trauma, particularly through the frontal basal area, when you see subarachnoid hemorrhage along the trajectory of a penetrating object, and if they're bullet fragments, for example, in the sylvian fissure, or a delayed hemorrhage occurs. As a patient who had a stab wound, it was neurologically fine, but the knife blade broke off in the blood vessel. You can see its relationship to the sylvian fissure vessels. Vasospasm occurs, and vasospasm might occur when there's traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Importantly, one can relate those CT angiograms to CT perfusion to determine if there's an effect on flow, and this can help direct therapy, for example, augmentation of blood pressure to improve blood flow. As I said in the beginning, one of the disadvantages of CT is transport of a patient. It can adversely affect brain metabolism. I think one of the best investments for an intensive care unit that's taking care of patients with brain injuries is a portable head CT scanner. You simply move the patient into the scanner and these studies are just as good as a regular head CT scan. The quality of the imaging is excellent and allows one to make bedside decisions based on the imaging obtained in the ICU. It's important not to forget cervical spine clearance. Cervical spine injury is more common in those with head injury. There are criteria that exist for determining when imaging should be obtained. Well known is the nexus criteria. There's also the Canadian cervical CT rule that determine when somebody should be imaged. In the modern era with high quality CT, that is adequate for cervical spine clearance. A large number of studies have been performed that demonstrate that the likelihood of missing significant cervical spine trauma with simply doing a CT is extremely low. And it's very rare that I do an MRI study to clear the cervical spine. Instead, I use the MRI to guide surgical decision-making when we already know a fracture is present. Vascular imaging is important and should be considered when there's penetrating injury, particularly when there's traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage associated with the penetrating injury, fracture of the venous sinus, any neurologic deficit not explained by the anatomic findings on the head CT scan, certain fractures such as facial fractures where we suspect something else, e.g. an aneurysm rupture led to the trauma. And in patients who have features of specific neck pathology, for example, a fracture into the transverse foramen, or in this case, a seat belt abrasion, the imaging might then demonstrate, as you can see, a vessel occlusion of the vertebral artery as the fracture extending into the foramen transverse 
leading to a posterior circulation stroke. But what about advanced imaging? I think head CT scanning is the only imaging that you need in the first 48 hours after traumatic brain injury in terms of decision-making about care. Certainly, early MRI may be superior to describe subtle findings, but it doesn't necessarily affect management in the early phase. So the CT is appropriate for the urgent detection of space-occupying lesion, but more advanced imaging can help with later prognostication. Here's a CT that looks relatively normal, but as you can see on MRI, there's a brainstem contusion. This could then explain why a patient is not improving or determine whether they need further care. One could use more sophisticated imaging, as has been done by Louis Pubasset and others, with DTI imaging. And this is generally used in patients who remain in coma several days after surgery to then decide who should get ongoing care. And this is a fairly robust method to determine who may improve. So take home messages. Traumatic brain injury is certainly a dynamic pathophysiologic process. It starts at the moment of impact and can evolve over time. Imaging is fundamental in traumatic brain injury management, not only about diagnostic decision-making, but to phenotype the patient and hence determine prognosis. The most important study in the acute phase is CT. It's quick, it's easy to do, it identifies surgical pathology rapidly, and that's the key first step in deciding how to manage those patients. As I said earlier, I think having a portable CT scan is an excellent adjunct to any intensive care unit. MRI is used for latent studies to deliver potential biomarkers for prognostication, particularly in patients who might have underlying diffuse axonal injury. There are ongoing research questions. Will these imaging biomarkers help us in being accurate prognostic indicators? Can we better phenotype patients who are going to have long-term behavioral and cognitive decline? And are we going to better able to target therapeutic agents? Thank you.